Dear students, uh, welcome to um, part two of uh, our module two, uh, where we're reviewing the Python and programming techniques. And uh, in this uh, module, uh, in this part specifically, uh, I'm going to be talking uh, how to deal with BSD sockets in Python. And uh, just to give a few ideas of uh, what uh, lecture is about, what uh, what these sockets are and uh, what's actually going to happen and what you're supposed to do as part of your project. Um, so what is the socket? I already, uh, I think, mentioned uh, in the introduction, introductory lecture that the socket is something that actually connects the application uh, to the network and to the other application. So effectively, uh, you create a socket, uh, which is kind of an outlet through which you can, uh, in your application, uh, can send and receive data, and you don't care how exactly this process is happening inside the network. And on the other side, this application is uh, doing the same, just creating this magical socket, and uh, from this magical socket, everything is happening. Uh, so effectively, you can send messages, you can send data, uh, and do in the opposite direction. Uh, so note that I have used two different words, uh, data and messages. So this actually depends on the specific uh, type of the socket that we're creating. So if we're dealing with a TCP uh, that is kind of providing our reliable connection, in that case, we're sending simply data or data stream, receiving data stream, like that is reliable data stream. If we're talking about UDP or similar protocols, those actually operate in terms of packets or messages or sometimes also use the word datagrams. It's actually it's coming from the datagram protocol. Okay, so I hope you got some idea and uh, throughout the, um, this presentation, uh, we're probably, you're probably going to get a little bit better idea what I'm talking about here. Okay. So now, uh, now we're talking specifically about this TCP and UDP because uh, for the purposes of, uh, of the sockets, uh, for, for the purposes of this introductory, uh, they behave very, very similarly. So for identification purposes, uh, when you're creating a socket, I mean, there are several operations that I will show you. Uh, so you need to create a socket and then establish some form of a connectivity. For TCP connection, it would be actual connection. Uh, for UDP, you don't need to have any kind of connection, but you still need to identify where you want to send uh, specific packets. Uh, so for the identification, there's actually two parts uh, that involved in the process uh, in, and maybe a little bit even more than uh, two parts. But uh, the, basically there is IP address that identifies the host and the port number that actually identifies the specific application or application instance or some version of instance within the application. And uh, we're going to have a source port, a source uh, destination, uh, source IP address, and destination port, destination IP address. And on the slide is effectively a highlight uh, what uh, kind of those IP addresses and port numbers uh, could be. Uh, so the example here is with the IPv4 addresses, uh, and you can easily use IPv6 addresses as well with this mm, mm, kind of. Uh, in, in your implementation doesn't really matter. And most likely you can uh, you will be actually using IPv6 if you're using some form of a DNS resolution, but it would be completely transparent to you. And uh, just in case, uh, remember uh, when we're going to be talking about the sockets, we're going to have a client socket, uh, we're going to have a server socket, and uh, we're actually going to have a client socket inside the server. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. And again, remember that each socket is actually being identified uh, for the TCP case. It's identified by the all four components. So it's a source port, a source, destination, source uh, IP address, destination port, destination uh, IP address. Uh, so that would be tuple for TCP. For UDP, it's technically just identified by the destination IP address and then uh, Oh, apologies. Uh, it's identified by the source IP address and source port, but in some cases uh, you can, like as part of the BSD socket interface, it actually can behave almost exactly like TCP, like virtually like TCP. There's some uh, ephemeral connection that it doesn't really connect to anything, but at least behaves as a TCP style. Okay. So now moving to the actual sockets. So there's uh, actually uh, several processes that's happening when you're uh, dealing with sockets, like uh, with the socket API specifically. Uh, so first of all, you have to create the socket. 
And when you're creating a socket, you actually you asking the operating system to to allocate your memory like of some specific uh, file descriptor that is associated with a specific pro transport layer protocol. So for example, you can create a socket that is for TCP, or you can create socket that is for UDP. Uh, and there are also other types of sockets. Uh, the most famous one is Unix socket, if you're working on a Unix-like system. As uh, after you created the socket, so this one is just, it's not connected, it's not associated with anything. It's just a socket, some memory allocated inside the operating system. The next moment, it really depends on what uh, kind of operation you want to do. If you want to create a client that connects to something, or like simply, yeah, if you want to create a client that connects to something, then you have to call the connect API and then uh, continue from that point of time. Uh, if you're creating a server or dealing with UDP, so then the process is a little bit uh, more complex and I will try to go over that. So there's a few operations that's associated with uh, creating uh, the server and, and after that the server and the client can actually do some kind of sending and receiving of data. So it's can, it can call send, write, and it can also handle some form of a timeout. So timeouts is actually uh, one of the items so for the projects that I will be looking uh, more closely because it's a little bit non-trivial. And the final step is the closing of the sockets. I will tr we will try to do it uh, very carefully in uh, our programs uh, and it's kind of important especially for TCP because you want to uh, uh, free up the resources because the number of ports, the number of like resources on operating system is actually limited and you don't want to waste of those resources. Okay, so this one is the overall picture of uh, the client and server process uh, of all the socket APIs. A as you can see, there is a number of uh, methods that exist. For, the, for example, for the client, uh, there is a socket, connect, write, read, and close. So uh, what I would kind of to highlight, you have to create a socket, you have to connect, and then get some kind of a connection out of it. Hopefully it's not uh, failed. And then you can write and read from the socket. And finally, you close it. Uh, from the server perspective, uh, there's more operations involved. So you have to create the socket, you have to bind uh, to address. So this one uh, kind of binding the socket to a specific uh, local uh, source IP address uh, source port. So it's kind of creating the for, uh, one side of the, uh, of the socket. So then uh, the second step is listen, it's kind of just to indicate that we are trying to listen for the incoming connections and uh, the Finally, look at the fourth step in this process is accept. And uh, so this one, as I will show you a little bit later, is simply uh, waiting for the incoming connections. And as soon as some connection being established, uh, it will mm, kind of trigger some actions and then create a new socket that is associated with uh, whatever new connection uh, is, uh, from the server perspective, it would be remote IP address, remote uh, port uh, with some uh, created uh, IP address, uh, like local IP address and local port, which not uh, necessarily be the same as the one that we're binding. It may be the same, but not necessarily. And finally, we can do read, write, again, read more stuff, and finally close the socket. Uh, so that's kind of the overall process, uh, and uh, kind of remember this, or maybe put it somewhere, uh, kind of when you write in the program, like have a good memory of kind of the, uh, the steps. Uh, because there will be, so these steps uh, representing the uh, canonical uh, BSD socket API, but they also exist in uh, Python API as well. Uh, just one note uh, about the Python API and specifically for the project. So there are uh, multiple higher level functions available as part of the socket API in Python. You're not allowed to use, uh, use them uh, in projects. Uh, so for example, send all, receive all, or even like even higher level things like HTTP server, uh, you cannot use them. Like uh, you, the objective in uh, this project is simply to play with BSD sockets, like in the raw BSD sockets and figure out all the intricacies of these network operations. Uh, afterwards, you, you are free to, uh, be, beyond this class, you are free to use like higher level APIs that will avoid you to uh, re kind of necessity to recreate the same patterns over and over again.
Okay, so let me just go over the basic operations. So the first one is creating a socket and for um, uh, Python, uh, this is very simple. You, s you have to import the socket module uh, and then call the socket API, uh, like create the object uh, socket. Uh, this object accepts several parameters. Uh, we're usually going to be using just two first parameters. So the first one is uh, AF uh, init. Uh, which represents the IPv4. Uh, for IPv6, there will be a slightly different family. Uh, then you create a type of the socket. So this uh, strange name, sock stream, actually represents the TCP. Uh, for UDP, there will be a different one, uh, which is a sock dgram, like a datagram protocol. Uh, for the protocol, uh, I don't remember what exactly this proton number is, and you don't really need to worry about this file number. This is something uh, Python specific. And I gave you just example of how to create a socket. To give you some uh, basic practice exercise, I just uh, tried to recreate uh, this example. So like import socket, uh, and then uh, we're creating sock, uh, sock, uh, oh, sorry, socket, again socket, and then I'm trying to I use the EF init uh, socket uh, digram soc datagram, and I'm not going to even specify the rest of the parameters that uh, they're not necessary. So if I try to run the program, uh, it will simply, it's supposed to run, uh, run, run. And we select scratch. Yeah, so it just ran, it did nothing. And it actually did nothing. If we print this socket at this point, uh, it will just print that it was socket was created and it uh, actually did nothing. It said proto and l address. It's actually indication of the local address and we didn't do, we didn't assign anything yet. Okay, so getting back to the step two is actually binding stuff. So binding um, kind of is a simpler operation. Uh, it uh, has only uh, one parameter that uh, kind of accepts. Uh, but uh, the problem of this parameter is actually, it has multiple meaning depending on what type of the uh, protocol you are using. So for example, if you're using a Unix path, this address is simply a string. Uh, if you're using AF init or AF init 6, which is IPv4, IPv6, then you have to specify the tuple of host and the port number, host and the port number. And I gave you example how you can do that. And let me try to do this. So I will try to sock bind and I'll just literally specify this one. Um, I'll specify this way, local host and one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I will tell you later uh, when we're going to be talking more specifically with uh, for the network layer protocol and transport layer protocols. Uh, so there's a very limited number of ports. So there's a kind of the range of the ports is from zero to uh, two to the 16 minus one. So that's kind of the whole range because the uh, the size of the field in the, in the packet uh, it's actually just two bytes and you cannot fit more numbers. Uh, but on top of that, all ports until one, uh, 123 are reserved for the server side. So if you try to create uh, some applications that uh, use kind of trying to listen on those ports, like port 80, port 21, so this is the common ports, uh, then you have to use the super user privileges, um, like administrator privileges on, on Windows. This is just a restriction of the operating system. Uh, but you can almost freely use any other port. So for example, I just randomly pick this one, two, three, four, five, and uh, hopefully everything will be, will, will be fine. And I'll just print this sock and we'll see what's gonna happen. And the second one, it's uh, printed out and it is telling me that this socket is 127, one, two, three, four, five. With that, we were able to bind the uh, specific IP address and specific port to the uh, to, the, to that specific socket. Uh, but this uh, didn't do any, anything useful. So it's still kind of random socket. It's not doing anything you cannot send or receive data because it's only created part of that socket. So you still need to uh, have the remote side. And for that, uh, I'll talk a little bit more what I was talking about there. Uh, for that, you, for the server operation, you have to listen, like wait for some kind of incoming connection and uh, accept connections. 
So the listen operation is quite simple. It's uh, you just need to specify that you ex you expecting uh, incoming connection for the socket, and you can specify the backlog. And backlog is a very interesting parameter. It's simply saying it's a number of pending connections uh, that you will accept uh, at the same kind of it's a queue for the incoming connections. So what you expect it to do uh, the next step, as I said, uh, you need you expect it to accept connections and if you accepting connections very slowly and you, you have multiple incoming ones uh, you can build up some form of a queue so this is similar like a packet queuing but just happens at the application side uh, and there are different ways how you can address the, this queuing uh, and we'll talk about this later uh, and finally the accept is uh, simply uh, waits until some connection uh, being created, like somebody establishes connection toward that server, and if, when it establishes, whatever, for TCP it would be some form of a handshake, and for UDP it's not really a connection, but uh, it will just indicate there will be, there is a new uh, remote uh, destination that sends you a first packet, so there is no real connection establishment. But the, there is no parameters for this call. Uh, there is only return parameter, and the, there are two return parameters: is a connection or like the socket associated with that new connection. So that would be real uh, socket through which we can communicate, because this one will have the local address and some remote address. They may change a little bit. Uh, I mean, the local IP, IP, uh, endpoint, this uh, at least port number, can change a little bit. Uh, but it also will specify the remote uh, IP address and remote port. Okay, now uh, I can actually show everything together uh, in some uh, basic life example. I have a small hint here, uh, so I'll try to write it based on the examples that we had. So I'll just list, oh, listen, and this time I'll specify one, socket, accept, uh, and client socket and client address. So if I didn't do anything more, uh, this program will try to wait forever until some uh, connection being established to this uh, server. So if I try to run, uh, it's supposed to, oh, apologies, it's, I have to call it on an instance of the socket that I have created, not on the class, or on, on the module. So if I run it again, uh, Operation not supported on the socket. Oh. Uh, yes, I cannot <laughs> do this operation on the datagram socket, so apologies for that. Uh, but now it finally should work, and as you may notice, uh, the program actually stalled. Nothing is happening, and I don't know, like you may not know what exactly is happening. But uh, what is happening is uh, the program is expecting the connection. So it's kind of working as a demon. Uh, it's not consuming too many resources, uh, just waiting and waiting and waiting. And there are a few commands that we can use to debug, at least on uh, Unix and Linux operating systems, uh, at least check whether someone is listening on a specific port number. So for example, we can use command netstat, and I'll just use minus a minus n uh, parameters, and grab uh, one, two, three, four, five. So just oh, netstat. Uh, so what this command is saying is that there is someone, some application, it doesn't know which exactly one, uh, and on uh, Linux you can actually specify minus p parameter uh, and run it as a super user. That will tell you which specific program is uh, listening for this uh, connection. But it's simply stating that there is a TCP state and someone is listening. And uh, for the debug purposes, I will try to go con try to connect to that uh, server to that port number. And for that one, you can use telnet command. Uh, on Linux, it's installed. For on uh, I think on Windows, it also can be easily installed. And on Mac, on the recent versions of Mac, it's not installed by default, but you can always get it from Mac ports. And what you can see here, uh, the program did something is the telnet connected and is saying the connection lost and the reason it lost because uh, where's my run yeah because the process finished so we didn't do anything with that connection let me uh, do a little bit more uh, accepted connection from 
and client address. So this way we at least are going to see some uh, output written. Oh, uh, let's highlight another problem. Uh, let me figure out how to resolve this problem. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a conditional thing that I will talk in a few slides and I will explain uh, exactly why. But uh, what uh, happened so far is um, <laughs> we didn't close the socket. So that's a simple thing. So we closed the application, but the, like, all local sockets got closed, but the operating system still kind of the socket it became in some form of a dangling state. And when we tried to run it immediately, the same program immediately again, it started to complain that, oh, I cannot do anything because some other program already using this port number and this IP address locally. So you cannot listen twice on the same thing. Uh, but hopefully with that option, it will allow us to create the socket. Yeah, so it uh, didn't complain this time. And if I do the same telnet again, I'm expecting uh, kind of do this telnet do nothing, uh, but I'm also expecting to see this accepted connection. So as you can see, we accepted connection again from the, this local host IP address and with some uh, random port number that was assigned by operating system as part of this connection establishment process. Okay, so now we got to the point that we are ready to send and receive data. And uh, let me try to do a very, very, very simple thing uh, as uh, we can data uh, client socket receive. And we specify how much I want to receive. Like uh, up, it, you not necessarily receive all this amount. So that's kind of one important note here. Uh, you may receive less or you may not receive anything. So you have to check that you actually receive uh, some data. So if not received, this will be returned as none or something like that. And then uh, what we will try to do, we simply uh, send the whole thing back to the server. So like, we can uh, do one time of uh, echoing back all the input that we received to, to the server side. So kind of, we'll see what's gonna happen. So we received and then we client suck, uh, socket uh, sent and specifying just that buffer that we received and exactly the same comment that I did about the receive uh, even though you specify the full buffer you're not guaranteed to to send everything so you have to record a length that was sent out and then do some kind of a checking uh, let me just check send print Uh, just in case this is another way uh, you can print out things without doing the explicit string formatting. So I could do this, like using commas, then it will automatically put spaces. Or I can just put a D and change this comma to um, percent sign. Uh, let me do this. So if data, then I can print received bytes. And just for fun, I'll do it twice. L. I better not to use lang because lang is a reserved keyword. Uh, and okay, so we now have received bytes, we have sent bytes, and let us do be very nice here. We close the client socket, close, and we have a server socket which is just a sock. We also do in close, and that's it. So that's the whole program. So we creating the socket, we bind into the local thing, we listening, we expecting to at least one connection in a queue, then we accepting connection by waiting and kind of effectively accepting connection, receiving some data, again, this will block at some for some time. Uh, as soon as we receive something, we send in, trying to send everything back and uh, closing the sockets. So let me try this one again, uh, nothing is happening, but if I open the terminal, uh, it should not uh, exit, it should expect for some input and I can input something and as expected it received the input from the server and closed the connection and if I open this one it literally told me that it received 13 bytes and sent 13 bytes. I'll, I cannot emphasize more and more and more uh, you're not guaranteed to receive everything that ha what has been sent out uh, there are no boundaries, especially for TCP, so you have to be very careful uh, in your implementation. 
uh, and you can receive one byte like only just one byte uh, or receive the whatever up to number of bytes that you specified as part of the re receive call another one that uh, i want to mention here is uh, the the fact everything is blocking here and uh, later in the lecture i will show you how to deal with non-blocking mode so you, you, what i mean by blocking whenever i call the sock except the program freezes at this point. Nothing after this uh, statement can be executed unless something happens. And what can happen uh, is some bad uh, things like a pretty system ran out of memory and like something explosion and you're gonna get some form of exception. Uh, so that's one way uh, and the same thing, oh, there are two places to so accept and uh, for all receive and send when you're using sockets in so-called blocking mode uh, those can throw exception whenever some bad things happen. And for these guys, it's actually a uh, timeout event. So for example, if uh, you disconnected between two hosts and you still wanted to send at least one byte and it's not happening, not happening, not happening, at some point uh, TCP will give up and notify your application that uh, this socket is no longer valid for communication. Uh, this will be also tested as part of the your application, but you actually will need to do a little bit more than uh, simply relying on TCP notifying you. In your application, you will have to explicitly handle timeout like much shorter than what the TCP is providing. Okay, I think I have covered the server side. Um, so, for your simplicity or like for to simplify your life. Uh, I will be providing you snippet codes uh, with uh, examples of code uh, similar to what is written on the slides, but in a slightly different way. So you, you can actually see them uh, on, the site, on the site here. Uh, you can use those as a initial uh, guidelines, or you can kind of write your own for completely from the scratch, just following what I was doing a, right now. We're done with the server. Now, for the client side, the things are pretty much similar. You still need to create a socket and the sec you, you don't need to bind, you don't need to listen, but you need to uh, set up the connection. So you have to call the sock connect. Okay, I'm gonna comment out everything here and I'm gonna reuse my server from uh, that implementation. And here, I, again, from the scratch, I'm import the socket. Uh, I'm creating socket, socket, uh, again, socket, if. In it. And for fun, I'll try to use uh, EF uh, uh, IPv6. Now we're going to have socket again, the same stream, uh, oops, suck stream to create a TCP socket over uh, IPv4, IPv6. And finally, okay, that was kind of fun, but I'm um, not going to do this fun. Otherwise, my other server will not accept connections. Uh, so now we suck connect. And uh, so the connect uh, except is also one parameter like uh, bind, but in this case, uh, you're trying to connect to the remote. So if in bind, you were specifying the local IP address. In uh, connect, you're trying to specify remote IP address and port. And but it's in, done in the same way, uh, depending on what the type of the socket you're using. So for IPv4, you have to specify IPv4 IP address and port. Uh, for six, it's uh, IP6 and port. For sockets, uh, for the Unix socket, that would be path to that socket. Um, and just let's do the same thing: 127.0.0.1. And let me remember what the port I was using. Uh, I think this one, okay. I used for some reason different port number. So the socket connect, uh, it may return something. You should double check the uh, documentation, but effectively we already created a socket and we're simply asking this socket to be connected. And uh, if with TCP, it will try to establish connection. It will try to block until connection established or not established. And uh, if it's established, then everything will be fine. If in, for in blocking mode, it will throw exception if connection cannot be established. So now at this point, we can start reading and writing. And if this is a connect, uh, so let's do this way. So suck uh, send, and we'll try to send some initial buffer. And remember what I was doing. So we cannot, for the socket, we need to specify the buffer. Uh, and 
this one is not a buffer so even though it may behave like this but if you put letter b uh, this one will be encoded as a symbol buffer so we're going to be sending foobar and for the fun of it i will just add the carrier carrier return and a new line so this one very common thing in uh, network protocols like in http uh, smtp and many others that use similar uh, formats so now i send uh, i can actually l print send bytes gee cannot spell word bytes l and what else i guess we'll try to receive whatever we can receive so suck receive um b um, and let's say up to 124 characters and we'll try to received and i will format with the quotes here b uh, again it will complain it should complain because we're receiving a uh, buffer it doesn't complain but uh, it may complain eventually so i will try to uh, will try two things i will try to run it uh, without running the server and in this case it's supposed to reject my connection immediately and give me some form of exception yes so it's uh, it literally gave me the connection refused error connection uh, refused this not gonna happen always so this happened because i was running on the local computer and kind of local computer knew immediately that uh, that port number is not associated with any application uh, if you're running trying to connect to the remote place you may get this error uh, because some applications some operating systems are nice and um, they're responding with the error message that no application exists or in some cases when firewalls plug in all the all such exchanges then you're not going to receive anything uh, but now i'm try i'll try to run my server that i had before uh, which one was that let's say this one okay so it's listening and i will try to run my application so in this case what happened uh, is i have sent eight bytes it literally indicated this part I mean, I can create a socket, connect it to the, successfully to the remote site. Uh, uh, let me also add additional stuff. Uh, socket, uh, print information about the socket before and after connection. Uh, it would uh, actually, supposed to print slightly different things. Let me rerun my server and run again. Yeah, so in this case, it indicates so before we created it, it was similar to the server site. It was just local address and nothing was happening. Uh, after we started, uh, after we connected, uh, it uh, added the local address and remote address to that connection. So the socket can uh, start doing some operations. And afterwards, what I did, we, I sent some information that happened to be eight bytes. And afterwards, I received the buffer um, from that. As you can see, it's printed out in some weird way. Uh, let me try to do that. So if you're trying to exp get strings, so you, uh, you need to decode that buffer into the UTF-8 string. Uh, I hope that would work. No, it's not working because I still need to rerun the server. And run again. Yeah, so it's in this case it's uh, worked and it print out as a normal string. Uh, notice one thing: um, I'm keep rerunning my server. Uh, so in your projects, this should not happen. So your server should accept a new connection, like process that connection, then accept new connection, accept new connection. So it should not ever stop, and unless I'm using like Control C uh, to stop the server. Uh, in all other cases, it should keep running and accepting new connections. Okay, I think that's uh, what uh, for the client side uh, things are working nice. Uh, let me give you a few um, related uh, comments. So the one that I skipped was uh, about ordering. Uh, so this one is um, quite important. Uh, it will be important a little bit later, especially for the project too. Uh, it was important in CC++ even for the basic thing like a port number. Python was nice enough to indicate that uh, things are better. But uh, what this byte ordering means is uh, memory representation of a variable can be different. So for example, integer, um, let's say it's a four bytes. And depending on the platform, 
how these four bytes are used, which of these um, bytes representing the, uh, the least significant digit and which represent the most significant digit really depends on the platform. Because some platform decided that the least significant is uh, something at the end of, uh, of these four bytes, like uh, one, two, three, four is on this side, or, and on other platforms uh, they represented this number uh, to be on the other side. Oh, and there are some other combinations of these. So when you have something like integers encoded uh, or some other values encoded, you actually have to pay close attention what the order is. Uh, and because otherwise your program may not be fully compatible uh, with other stuff. So people create the convention that the, all the networking applications, all the stuff on the network should have the uh, so-called network order or the same thing as the so-called the big endian uh, order. Um, and this is just a matter of which position this most significant and least significant bit is uh, created. Uh, for C++, uh, I, I gave you or C, C++ API, I gave you just a reference there, this uh, helpers, a host to network short, host to network long, network to uh, host short, network to host local. So this is simply getting the network or like getting the host value and converting it to the network value. Uh, sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's not the same. And um, the other set is just doing the opposite operation. Uh, for the Python, you will play quite a bit with the so-called struct, uh, struct pack operation, and that one uh, will be doing that for you. But you still need to uh, effectively indicate that you want the data to be encoded in a specific network order. So you need to specify this uh, first character of the format string as an exclamation mark. So the other one that I missed the part was the hostname versus IP address. Um, before, like in the examples that I was using in the samples in sample code that I have been providing, um, I, I'm using explicitly IP address and this 127.001. And for the client, you can actually try to play with something different. You can literally specify this www.google.com. Uh, instead of IP address, and Python will automatically try to get IP address from that hostname. And this kind of happened behind the scene inside the Python, which is trying to do DNS query and like to get the A record and get the IP address from that. We will talk more extensively about DNS, but just know there is this process behind the scenes. Um, if we were using C++ or C API, then you would actually have to do it uh, very explicitly, trying to like resolve this IP address call, use this spe special API. But luckily, we're using Python, so you have a little bit less work to do. I already gave you example of a client. Uh, we did send and received. I uh, already commented uh, about the TCP framing. Again, there is no guarantee of any kind that whatever was sent was received in one kind of one instance, uh, even though like I on the, cli on the client or server command or server side, I called receive, well, uh, sorry, I called send twice with like two buffers of one and buffers of two. I may get one call uh, as a receive, like I may get all three bytes in one. I may get them as they were sent out, like one and two, or I may get uh, like three uh, different bytes of uh, size of one. So everything is possible and you cannot have any assumption of uh, what kind of order you receive in data. Like in, in your application, you have to properly process that. Luckily uh, for kind of project, um, we're not, we don't have anything special. We just need to send all the data and receive all the data and save it into the file. So that simplifies your life. But if we're implementing something like HTTP processing or SMTP or even some form of FTP, then you would have like a lot, a lot of problem and a lot of uh, things to worry about how to figure out where this boundary in the application site is, in application stream. As I said, Closing the sockets is extremely important. And like while running uh, this lecture, we already experienced the problem with not closing properly the server side socket. Uh, so you have to close it. Unfortunately, there are places, I mean, normally 
you just close it at the end of the program and uh, everything is fine. You have to be very careful with all these exceptions because when exception is created, created you, you still need to cancel the socket. But if you didn't handle that exception properly, then something bad is going to happen. Uh, so in cases when you're using um, blocking sockets, you better use something like with structure. So with is simply simplification, uh, it's effectively automatically will call close when you exit in the scope. So for example, if I created a socket in this way and kind of assign sock uh, variable, then it will be automatically closed compared to the previous one that when, uh, when I had to explicitly close the socket uh, as I did in the example. Okay. Now, get into slightly different uh, elements. So, assume we create a, like, have a, one modification to the server. Like, where is my server? Uh, let's say I'm using this version. Uh, this is the one that I'm using the with construct, so you can explore the working example. Uh, so, in this example, I will just a little bit change. Uh, so, right now, there is one accept, but I'll change this uh, while true. So this is just, well, a very simple change. So I'm trying to accept all connections. So I accept one connection, I process that connection, uh, I'm done, I'm waiting for the new connection to arrive. Again, I'm done with that one, I get, I get that one. So if I run uh, this server now, I will try to do it in a terminal. Okay, it's running. And I'm running our, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted. So the same client, I can run it once. It's hopefully did uh, did the work. I'm gonna try it twice, third time. So every time I'm running, everything is happening. And as you can see in terminal um, of, of the, for the server side, you also get in the connection, getting connection, getting processed, and and so forth. So everything seems to be fine. Very small modification. Everything is working uh, with one potential problem. So what if you either have very bad client? or very bad connection between server and the client. So like if a first client is connected, the servers can start processing that client. And uh, the client, instead of sending immediately, delays the sending by whatever, two minutes. So the server is still waiting this blocking code, in this blocking read uh, or receive method, is still waiting for that one client uh, to send some data. If at any point of time the second client try to connect to the server, so that connection will go to the listen queue, like the one that we specified. But uh, because the server still didn't call the accept, uh, this connection will not be accepted or processed until this client one disappears. So what to do? And uh, in reality, there are several ways how to, how you can deal with this uh, uh, approach. Uh, and kind of there are two major ways. One, you can create a, each individual thread. So like if you're familiar with the multi-thread processing for each client. So for example, uh, whenever you accept uh, or like fork, if you heard the, uh, this thing before. So when you accept uh, the connection, you s simply span a new thread or a sub process and start processing that client in that sub process. Uh, so now you again ready to accept new connection and accept new connection, span new thread and do the work and, and, and so forth. That's a working approach, but uh, there is a better way of uh, doing this business, especially for uh, some special servers that don't do too much, uh, just to do very, very fast processing uh, of the data. So you can uh, actually avoid uh, threading, but use the approach of concurrency. So in this case, uh, instead of uh, accepting connection, blocking uh, at the receiving, uh, what server can do is can just uh, poke it, like uh, just like go over all these uh, connections that it already accepted and just check with them. Like if any data arrived, if any data arrived, then it will process this uh, small piece of data and maybe send it back. Uh, if uh, nothing arrived, it will just uh, keep waiting. Uh, and so, as you can see, in this case, there is no blocking of any kind. So, server can accept connection uh, and start uh, poking, well, poking it in, in big quotes, uh, just waiting for something to happen on the socket. So as soon as some data arrived on socket one, it quickly processed that the socket one data and still waiting for some other uh, data to arrive on different places. 
So to handle this uh, in API, in um, socket APIs, there is a concept of a select mechanism. Uh, they implement it in different ways on different operating systems, but they just know uh, that there is this magical select mechanism uh, which allows you to simply wait on, uh, on kind of have a set of sockets available uh, and wait on all of them for some operation to happen. Either there is uh, some data available to read or there is some place uh, available to write, or like there is some buffer available to write data to. And yeah, so already mentioned this one. Uh, and I gave you an example. I'm not going to go over a detailed uh, implementation like a, in a real time implementation uh, because it's a little bit more cumbersome and like much more code available. Uh, but uh, you can see on our slides one way of implementing, and in a snippet code, I try to do exactly the same thing uh, but with additional organization. Uh, so in that one, I just introduced the concept of the module, uh, so you can you know, at least get a hint of how you can organize your code for the project instead of implementing everything in a single file. Uh, but uh, just to note one thing, uh, the important step uh, every time you want to, do, to use this concurrency using the select mechanism, you have to switch socket into non-blocking mode. And this applies separately to each socket that being created, you explicitly creating or being created for you through the accept process. So, for example, if you um, if you're using a socket operation, uh, if you want to use non-blocking mode for the server socket, the one that accepts connections, uh, you don't necessarily want to do that, but uh, for the project, do that because this is the only way you can uh, properly handle properly handle timeouts that is defined by the specification. Uh, so you just need to oops uh, just need to call this lsoc set blocking false, and that's it. Uh, this will effect effectively change the behavior of all the methods that previously were blocking blocking. So accept will not block, will kind of exit immediately, but you will need to kind of register it with the select mechanism and wait for some read event to arrive and read equivalent to some new connections is coming. And uh, read will not block, write will not block, and you will have to kind of, you will specify what you want to do, but it not necessarily will happen uh, immediately uh, as you may be expecting it. Uh, so the second step, uh, you, you better kind of learn this one, uh, copy paste what exactly is happening, explore the example a little bit more in detail how things are happening. Uh, but uh, it's very, very simple. So you create this uh, magical uh, selector, uh, the default selector will pick the, the most optimal for your operating system, because as I said, there's a multiple implementations for different operating system. And what you need to do is to register, um, in this case it's defined as a file object, but the socket is some form of a file object. And events can be either event read or event write. So what effect it will indicate, it will monitor whether the, the socket in this case is available for reading, uh, available for writing, or available for either of those operations. So it can register for specific operation or you can register for either of those operations. And another one that is quite useful for the Python stuff because it's kind of a callback mechanism in here, uh, it's a additional data that can be attached to the event that will be called. But it's nothing more than some application defined data. And again, if you explore the example on the slides, an example in a snippet code that I will be providing, uh, we're using this data parameter to just record uh, the, the state of the connection. And you probably want to do something similar for your implementation of the project one and two. And finally, the socket, uh, the, the server side, uh, as I said, the listening part is very, very similar to what we already had. Uh, the only difference is, uh, uh, let me try to do the highlighting, uh, is the set non-blocking and we created uh, this one as a kind of selector and we wanted to just read events from the server side socket because there's nothing that you don't write to the accept socket. Uh, then uh, there's a, the, the other part that uh, uh, handles uh, connections, uh, like handles things are happening. So in, before, 
uh, we simply call the accept and then we start processing inside the inside that uh, accept <laughs> sorry we got the socket uh, and we start processing with that socket in the, in the case of uh, concurrent processing you have to think in a slightly different way because uh, what can happen the after kind of you waiting for the some events to happen it's either there is activity on the socket that you already accepted like the, the, for the connection, somebody send you data, or there is a new connection. So you have to distinguish between these two, and therefore have a different processing. Uh, so in this case, I simply did, uh, did this checking and uh, delegated all the processing to separate methods that uh, I will introduce in the, on the next slides. Uh, the one I want to highlight here is uh, this method. The timeout uh, thing is uh, quite important in a sense it will indicate how long the select will wait until some event happens. Uh, it may happen, uh, it, like for example, in a server case, if uh, no connections are being established, it will just simply block and displace forever until some connection is created. Uh, if you want additional behavior, if you want to do some kind of a check-in of the timeout, you need to specify instead of none, some value. And this value is in seconds. So for example, if you specify one, uh, even though no event happened, it will kind of there will be empty events in as part of this events uh, set or list or, or some container of the events. Uh, you need to specify. You can do additional processing. So check for timeouts, timeout the connection, like close some specific connection, and so forth. Okay, so we have like accept connection, service the connection. The inside of this accept and service connection are pretty much similar. Uh, they just have to add additional stuff uh, related to the kind of this concurrent processing. So we still have accept. We have uh, we still have to do this uh, setting non-blocking for the uh, client socket because this this is effectively a new socket that's been created and we still need to assign it a non-blocking mode. And the rest is associated with the um, concurrent way of uh, dealing with the connection. So because we're not immediately going to send and receive data. Uh, what we want to do is kind of store some information about the client. Uh, you may extend this part uh, as part of your project. And then register additional events for read and, uh, read and write uh, with that selector. And for the service connection, it's, uh, okay, it's got a little bit more complicated. Um, you should be able to infer what exactly is happening. And there is some uh, kind of notion of receiving part of the data, like getting some uh, information to the buffer uh, until all the data was received or connection got closed for some reason. Uh, so please uh, kind of evaluate the, these slides. Uh, this program try to play it in, in different cases, so try to play with the snippet code. Uh, you probably be able to reuse majority of the code of the snippet as part of the project one and then reuse it later for the project two uh, but it still would require a significant work on your part okay so what we can do so for the client side i'm not showing you the example because it would be very very much similar to the uh, server side but it's just simply not going to have the uh, accepting the connection uh, part of like the server socket. The rest is pretty much kind of similar. You have to implement some form of a logic for the process, the connection that has been established. And if you set the, so there are two different ways. You can set non-blocking before you uh, create the connection or after you create the connection. So if you do it before, so now you can listen for uh, listen until the connection was established and using the select mechanism and define any timeout that you would like. Uh, like for example, if you only want, want to wait for five seconds, so then you can wait select uh, with a timeout five uh, until the connection established if you use a non-blocking mode before you start to try to connect. Or if you do it afterwards, then uh, connect will still rely on, a, will still block until the connection is established or rely on some external mechanism uh, to define how long it will wait until something bad is being determined. And then all the processing inside will be done um, as part of the 
a non-blocking mode. Uh, I would highly recommend, like if you want really full credit for the project, to set up non-blocking right after you created the socket, like right before, I mean, in fact, in between create a socket and um, connection uh, for the client side and for the server side just before you do accept, and because other, other calls are non-blocking. And that's it. So hopefully you not didn't get too much bored uh, with this presentation. Um, I hope you got some idea how to deal with sockets, or at least what sockets are, um, how to like what is the general mechanism for the server side, what is the general mechanism for the uh, client side. I hope you got some idea how to do with the, how to deal with sockets in Python. Um, it's the process is much simpler than like raw BSD sockets in C++, but it's very much uh, same uh, as that one. Like it's just a little bit more high level things. You don't need to deal with very very low level things, and uh, so you can do that uh, for the client. There's just socket creation, connect read write whatever and uh, closing the socket for the server you create the socket you bind you potentially set some additional options you listen you accept uh, or we do multiple accepts then do read 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 write and close the uh, the client socket and close the server socket so there's a multiple close at uh, this point and finally for the concurrency you can uh, either deal with threading possible option you can implement your project just using threads um, I would say it's actually more complicated because you still need to deal with the race conditions potentially and some other issues o or simply use the, the concurrency mechanism using the select mechanism. Okay, I hope it was interesting. Uh, I hope you learn uh, quite a bit and see you later.